We're here on Wednesday night. Wednesday night's our Bible study, and we were going through the, the book of Proverbs, Proverbs 22, and I touched on a subject. We were, we were talking about, you know, loving not the things of the world, and I, and I started, you know, the, all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And I started going through different examples of things that are of the world that we shouldn't be, you know, loving, things that we shouldn't um, be focused on or, or, or really have part of our life as Christians that, you know, we, sh we should just be focused more on, on godly things, spiritual things. And uh, one of the things that came up was music, was our, you know, just modern worldly music. And I had mentioned in the sermon on Wednesday, I was just like, you know, I need to hit a whole sermon on this. So that's what I'm going to be doing this morning. It's been, it's, this isn't a new teaching for this church. It's been a couple years, though, since I last preached on this. So it's something that needs to come up. It's something that's a regular influence on us. It's something that you have to deal with all the time. I mean, you can't go anywhere these days with modern technology without just hearing the world's music just being blasted at you. I mean, you can't go to a gas station. You can't go to a department store. You can't go to a restaurant. You can't go hardly anywhere anymore these days when you go out without just hearing this music playing in the background. There's a reason for that. And we're going to get into a lot of that this morning. Now, we started off here in Ezekiel chapter 28. And the book of Ezekiel is not a very uplifting book, right? It's kind of a negative book. There's a lot of uh, pronouncements that Ezekiel is given against all these different lands, all these different kings, all these different places of God's judgment coming upon them because there's so much wickedness going on at this time. But what's interesting about chapter 28 here, if you look down here, he's, he's prophesying against the king of Tyrus, right? The king of Tyre, you know, Tyre and Sidon. Look at verse number two. It says, Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus, thus saith the Lord God, because thine heart is lifted up and thou hast said, I am a God. I sit in the seat of God in the midst of the seas. Yet thou art a man and not God. Though thou set thine heart as the heart of God. Behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that they can hide from thee. With thy wisdom and with thine understanding, thou hast gotten the riches and hast gotten gold and silver into thy treasures. By thy great wisdom and by thy traffic hast thou increased thy riches, and thine heart is lifted up because of thy riches. Now, He's, he's talking to, to the king of Tyre here, but there's, a, there's another application that's going to become more evident a little bit later in the chapter, who the king of Tyre is representing in this chapter. You think of, who is it that wants to be like the Most High throughout Bible? Anyone who's read their Bible knows who we're talking about. Who is it that's lifted up in their pride? Who is it that wants the worship for them and not for God? Who is it that tempted Jesus Christ in the wilderness and said, See all the kingdoms of the world? I'll give all these to you. He had all the riches. He had gotten them all the gold. Who, I mean, he's wiser than Daniel. I mean, think about how wise Daniel was. Daniel's known for his wisdom. Daniel was able to interpret the dreams. Daniel had great wisdom. He was a leader in the, in the, in the, in the empire. But this is someone who surpasses the wisdom of Daniel even, who has all these riches. And what did, what did Satan want of Jesus in the wilderness? If you just fall down and worship me, right? He wants to worship like God. He wants to be like God. He wants to be like the Most High. This is who we're looking at here now, and it's going to be even more specific and evident as we get into the chapter. Look at verse number 11. We're going to just keep reading here. We're going to pick up because he's still talking to the, to the king of Tyrus or the prince of Tyrus. Verse number 11, Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom, and perfect in beauty. Look at this. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Now, was the king of Tyre at that time in the garden of Eden? No, of course not. The Garden of Eden was shut off, and there's the cherubims with flaming swords guarding, you know, there's no more entrance into the Garden of Eden after uh, uh, Adam and Eve were kicked out. No one's going to the Garden of Eden anymore. This is obviously now he's referring to who he's really talking to. Thou hast been in the Garden of Eden. Who was in the Garden of God? Satan, right, as the serpent when he beguiled Eve and had her eat of the forbidden fruit. Thou hast been in Eden, the Garden of God. Let's keep reading here, verse 13. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, the topaz, and the diamond, 
the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the, and the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so, that thou wast upon the holy mountain of God, thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the, mer the, the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Again, I mean, he's calling him the cherub because Satan is a fallen angel, right? He's a cherub created by God. And it says here that he was, you know, he was perfect when he was created. He was this beautiful creature, great glory that God had given unto him. And it talks about all these precious stones, these beautiful stones to look at. So what we're seeing here as a description of Satan is someone who's really beautiful, you know, it's not the world's picture of Satan is the red guy with the pitchfork, the horns and the tail going, ah, 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 you know, and poking people and, and ruling hell. Right. But that is a completely false picture of Satan. That is not what Satan looks like. That is not who Satan is. First of all, Satan's not going to be ruling in hell. He's not doing it now and he never will be. He's not even in hell right now. Satan walketh about as a roaring lion seeking who, seeking who he may devour. He's going to and fro in the earth. And he's looking to, to attack people. He's looking to devour people. That's what Satan's doing. And you know what? Satan doesn't look like... If you were to come face to face with Satan, you'd have no idea it was him if you have this vision of, of having a, a red guy with horns or, or, some, or maybe some uh, you know, goat head and, and all these other images, like these satanic images. That's not what he looks like. He's going to look really nice. And you think about Satan is the great deceiver. He is, a, 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 he is the best deceiver that, that's ever existed. He has all this wisdom. He's been around for thousands of years now. He's accumulated a lot of knowledge. He was built beautiful. So when people look at him, and, and think about this, just in general, in your daily life, everybody's like this. When you run across someone who is attractive physically, that is pleasing to the eyes, the vast majority of people are going to treat that person different than someone who is not, right? You're going to treat them a little bit better, a little bit kinder, a little bit nicer, and you'll probably let your guard down a little bit just because someone is attractive. Well, that's how Satan is. That's how Satan looks. He's, he's extremely attractive. He looks really good. The Bible says that he's, you know, as an as a angel of light, he's going to appear like this great guy. And it's all to get your guards down and to make you be trusting in him and accepting of him. He is the best con man that has ever existed. And we need to be aware of this. We never forget this. Don't think that you would just be able to spot Satan. I mean, think about Judas. Jesus said he was a devil from the beginning, yet none of the other disciples knew that he was the traitor until well after it happened. When Jesus sat down with them at the Last Supper, they had spent years together, three years together, that they, they were going all over the place in this tight group of friends and, and disciples of Christ were going around ministering and got to know one another. They got to know Judas. But at the Last Supper, they didn't say when Jesus said, one of you is going to betray me, they didn't, they didn't all just go, yeah, it's Judas. None of them knew that. They all said, is it me? I mean, they trusted and thought they knew everybody else so well that all they could do is say, is it me? Because it can't be Matthew, it can't be John, it can't be Peter, it can't be Judas. Maybe it's me. That's the attitude that they had. And that's how sneaky, and, and you know what? He was a devil from the beginning, and he was a good con man. He was a false prophet, a false teacher, but he, but he, he infiltrated and snuck in as if he was part of the group. Now, we need to just make sure, I'm going over all this because we need to be aware that this is how Satan operates. So sometimes there's going to be things that don't, on the outward appearance, appear to be that bad. They appear just fine. They appear pretty good. 
I mean, there's a lot of preachers out there that on the outward, hey, they're wearing a suit, they're wearing a tie, they got the talk, you know. They're saying, hey, brother, hey, sister, you know, and, 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 and they're saying, praise the Lord. But on the inside, they're a ravening wolf. And we need to be aware. That's how Satan operates, and that's how the false prophets operate. And we need to just be aware of this and be mindful of this when you're going to make any type of judgments on things in your life that it's not just based on the outward appearance. Just about a week or two ago, I, I, I preached a sermon on judging and judgment and, and judging righteous judgment, as Jesus said we're supposed to do. Not judging on the outward appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Righteous judgment has nothing to do with being a respecter of persons. You know, the person who looks so nice and, and clean and, and clean cut and, and, you know, all this other stuff. Don't be a respecter of persons. Judge based on the content, based on, on, on the, the whole picture, not just the outward appearance. And what I'm, I'm, I'm pointing all this out, but what I really want to point out in this chapter, and the reason why we started here, is that this is obviously talking about Satan, but go back up here to verse number 13. We see that he's very beautiful, but that's not all that goes, that, that's, that's a part of his creation. Verse 13 says, Thou hast been in Eden in the garden of God, every precious stone, and we we'll go through all the stones. It says, The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. Tabrets and pipes. That's not the outward appearance. That's talking about his voice, and it's relating it to, you know, a tabra is a musical instrument. Pipes, like the pipes of an organ. I believe this very firmly, especially from this verse here. Satan is a musical creature. And you think about it, it makes sense. God created his cherubs, his angels, his beings for his glory, for his honor, for his pleasure. Right? Satan was created as a very beautiful creature by God. And with the outward appearance, it would make sense that he also gave him these tabrets and these pipes to make a joyful noise unto the Lord. That's what he was created for, but sin was found in Satan. Right? Satan fell. Satan, Satan became the devil and the deceiver when he sinned against God. He still has these attributes. That's the way God made him. But he's not using them for God. He's using them for himself. Satan has wisdom. Satan understands the way that we work probably better than we do. He's been around. He has a lot of knowledge on, on how humans operate and how we work. And Satan is a very musical creature. Turn, if you would, to Colossians chapter 3. Now, so far, I haven't proved anything to you yet. I'm going to get there about, about you know, the, the modern music and why we shouldn't be listening to it at all. But right now, it's just important to understand that Satan's a musical creature. This is going to be one of his methods of attack on us. This is one of the things that he's going to be able to do and do well to try to deceive us. Now I want to show you here in Colossians chapter 3 how powerful music is and how much influence it can have. And actually, music itself isn't a bad thing at all. Music is a great thing. God created Satan to have these great, you know, these tabrets and these pipes. But it's for him. Music, I love music. Music has always been a huge part of my life, always. I've always loved music, loved to sing music. The problem is, you know, before I got saved and even after I got saved, I was just into the wrong type of music. There's music that's good, there's music that's bad. Look at Colossians chapter 3, verse number 16. Colossians 3, 16 says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another, in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord, and whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. So we see here in verse 16, it says that, you know, let the word of Christ dwell in you, but we're, we're to be teaching and admonishing each other how? How do we teach and admonish each other? With psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Songs are used to teach. And this is one of the reasons why we sing the old hymns in this church. Because the old hymns are very full of doctrine. They're full of teaching. There is a lot of doctrine that you learn from these hymns. 
We sing like songs like Verily, Verily. It's all about salvation by grace through faith, and it's literally quoting parts of the Bible. There, there's so much good content. It's, you know, the songs of today, the, you know, the Christian songs of today, Christian contemporary songs, it's so just full of nothing. Right. It, it's, 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 it's something that, you know, the songs today are so generic that it's just about God in general. Right? It's just about you, you, most of these songs that, I, that I've heard on the radio, at least, and I'm not a follower of this at all, but um, sometimes I'll listen to talk, talk radio or, or talk Christians radio and stuff like that, and you just you flip through. And for one, I can't tell any difference between you know, the regular rock stations and the Christian rock stations unless I catch some of the words. It sounds exactly the same. It's completely patterned after the world. But not only that, it, it's so generic. I mean, it's like you could, pro you could probably put, sit, play some of these songs for a Muslim and they wouldn't have a problem with it. You could play these songs for, for anyone, a part of any other religion that just believes in God in general, and they'd say, yeah, that's great. Because there's, there's nothing being taught. There's nothing divisive. There's nothing saying specifically that's just you know, full of actual content and full of doctrine from the Bible. This is, you know, if we're to be teaching and admonishing one another, we need to have that in our music. But that is in the world's music, whether you realize it or not. There is teaching going on there. Turn, if you would, back to... Um, well, I'll read this for you. No, I'll turn, if you would, to Deuteronomy 31. I only want to see this. Deuteronomy 31. Music is powerful. Music has a, a, a profound influence on us, whether you realize it or not. Music is definitely used as a way of teaching. It's a way that, that God said it's a way of teaching. In Deuteronomy 31, we're going to see here God instructing Moses to write a song for the intent that it stays with the people, that it gets ingrained in in their memories and they don't forget the words of God because he put it as a song and he put it to music so that they could remember it. Look at Deuteronomy 31 verse 19. The Bible says, Now therefore, write ye this song for you and teach it the children of Israel. Put it in their mouths that this song may be a witness for me against the children of Israel. For when I shall have brought them into the land which I swear unto their fathers, that floweth with milk and honey, and they shall have eaten and filled themselves and waxen fat, then will they turn unto other gods and serve them and provoke me and break my covenant. And it shall come to pass when many evils and troubles are befallen them, that this song shall testify against them as a witness. For it shall not be forgotten out of the mouths of their seed. For I know their imagination which they go about, even now before I have brought them into the land which I swear. Moses therefore wrote this song the same day and taught it the children of Israel. So God's instructing Moses, write this song. Take this song and teach it to the children of Israel. Get it in their mouth so that they learn it, they have it memorized. And he says, you know what, in time to come, yeah, right now, you guys are going to be following me. Right now, you're going to have seen the battles. Right now, you're going to know the struggles. Right now, you're going to be closer to me. You're going to understand who I am. But in generations to come, when things start getting easy, when you don't have as many struggles, when you start being, because I bless you, and, you're, and you start getting wealthy, and then your children start to forget who the Lord even is, he says, they may forget me, but you know what? This song is not going to be forgotten out of their mouths. They're still going to be singing this song, whether they even realize it or not, what they're actually singing or, or what the words even mean. He says, this song is going to stick with them. And then, you know, at least some of them are going to, are going to come to their senses and say, wow, this is a witness against us because of where we had gotten to by this point. But this is something that he used to be able to transcend generations. I mean, something that was able to last, not only because it's God's word, but he says it's going to be in their mouths. You know, you could get God's word in your heart at any time by studying and memorizing his word, but you have to consciously do that. I mean, you have to make an effort to do that. You want to learn Psalm 100, as it was our memory verse for you know, this, this past month. You got to make an effort to go and do that. But he says when he gives them a song, all the children of Israel, they're going to know this song. 
Why? Because people are just going to be saying it's going to be part of the culture. There's going to be, it's just going to be music that they're going to realize whether or not they ever go to the tabernacle. They're going to know this song and it's going to witness against them. And that's, the, that's one of the powers of music is the ability to not only um, get into your mind, but to stay there. There is a staying power of music in your mind. And anyone who's listened to music should know that I have, I mean, I can't even tell you. And, it's, and, and I'm not saying this to glory at all. It's actually irritating how much of the world's garbage I have in my head right now. I could probably recite or sing to you songs of entire albums uh, for like scores of albums that are just stuck in my head. And when I hear it on the radio, it's just like I just know all the words. It's right there. Why? Because music is that powerful. It's able to get in. And once you get it in, you can't get it out. I mean, there's those songs that you might have even hated. You know, there's this like, why is this song stuck in my head? Just get this song out. But that's what that does. And that, and that just illustrates the power of music. And it's funny, you know, we could, we, we, you know, I often joke or laugh about it, but, but we need to be able to take a step back and say, you know, this is real. I mean, this is, this is a real effect that happens as a result of the music. It gets in your head and it stays there. Now, a bad, a bad approach to take to worldly music, the, world, the, the music that the world puts out, is to just think that it's benign, it's harmless. There's nothing wrong with the music that the world puts out because it's not. There is an agenda. There is something that, that is being taught to you when you listen to music. Even what you think is just the, the most harmless music in the world. Musicians, think about this. A musician's called an artist, right? I mean, anyone would agree with that. Musicians are artists. And what is the artist trying to do? They have a message that they want to convey. They're trying to illustrate something. You're trying to get something across. Now, I'm not saying art is bad. I'm not saying that artists are bad. But there's a message there. There's something that you are illustrating to someone or someone you're trying to convey, whether it be on a painting or whether it be through music or any other form of art, you're trying to convey something to them. This world's, today's musicians are no different. They have messages that they're trying to deliver. And the more you get to know about these people who you love to listen to on the radio, the more you learn about them, the more you're going to realize what their message is about. You start seeing who they really are. You know, when I was... Um, I always grew up relatively conservative, right? I grew up in a, in a pretty good home. I wasn't saved. You know, my parents weren't saved. But, but overall, I, you know, I, I thank God for the parents that I had. I thank God that they had rules for me. I thank God that they cared about me. And we, I grew up pretty conservative, right? Pretty, pretty old, fa relatively old-fashioned, pretty, you know, like pretty, pretty good. Not, not, not that bad, but as far as the world's concerned, right? But, man, where was I going with that? I grew up pretty conservative. <laughs> what? By the world's standards. By the world's standards, yeah, but, man, where was that? What in the world? The <laughs> <laughs> No, we're getting there in just a minute, though. Yeah, the artists, the artists have a message. I don't know. Let's just move on because I don't know at all. It's going to come back. As soon as we move on, I'm gonna, it's going to come back to my mind. But, um, you know, there, there's definitely a message being brought across by the world's music today. And... Um, To think that the music is benign is, is you're, you're deceiving yourself. The, the best scenario, the best case scenario with the world's music today is just that it's just that it's just worldly music. Now, we already saw, uh, we did this on Wednesday. We turn, if you would, to 1 John uh, chapter 4. We're going to look at it again right now. Or, I'm sorry, 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. First John chapter 2, verse number 15. Bible reads, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of 
the world. So we, we see here the Bible is telling us, look, don't love the world. The things that the world puts out, everything that the world teaches, everything the world does, that's not supposed to be things that we are spending our time enjoying, and those are the things that we love to do. We're supposed to be avoiding it anyways. And the best case scenario with worldly music is that, well, it's just put out by the world. You know, it, it, and the, the litmus test is, is it of the Father? If it's not of the Father, then it's of the world. Right? So when, you're, when, you, when, you, when you think about your favorite musicians, you think about your, your favorite bands, your favorite artists, right? Are they singing about Christ? Are they of God? Are they of the Father? Is that what they're about? Is that what they're promoting? If not... It's of the world. Okay? Now, that would be one thing, you know, and, and that's still just one level, but right away you can see, well, we shouldn't get involved with that anyways. That shouldn't be the stuff that we love if it's just of the world. The Bible says not to love the world, not the things of the world. If we love the world, the love of the Father is not in us. But I think it goes deeper than that. I think that these messages that are being put out there, oh, I know, yeah, now I know exactly where I was going. <laughs> It's there, all right. <laughs> I knew it would come back to me. The message that these people are trying to put across, when you get to know these artists, when you learn a little bit more about them, you'll get to understand where their, what their message actually is. So when I was growing up, I loved, I loved all kinds of music, all genres. I grew up in the, you know, in the 80s and in the 90s. And in the 90s is when all the, the grunge was real popular, right? That was kind of the, the in thing for the young people in the 90s. And there was the bands like Nirvana and Pearl Jam and stuff like that. And I remember because, because I had grown up relatively conservative and I had these, these views. And, you know, I was against, at the time, it was a big thing for high schools offering um, um, uh, birth control in the high schools and stuff like that. And I remember in, in, in our speech class, you know, I did pick a side and I, I picked again, you know, fighting against that. I thought that was wrong. And look, even just being unsaved and, you know, relatively worldly, I still was just like, you know, that's wrong. I could see that that was foolishness to just promote this and just say, oh, yeah, this is fine. Kids can do this stuff and just promote fornication. You know, I, I had a lot of values that were instilled in me. So when I would listen to the music that I love, because I love this music. I mean, when you hear the guitar and you hear the drums and it's like you start to feel like, man, I love this music. This music is great. It's awesome. It feels good to listen to this music. But then you get to know who these people are that are putting it out. And I'm just like, and I'll tell you what, this Eddie Vedder of Pearl Jam is wicked as hell. Yeah. I mean, he, this guy is extremely wicked, extremely pro-murder. I mean, they call it pro-choice. He's a pro-murder just pro-death. This, this guy is, is a devil. And any time I would hear him speak, because he was always speaking about, about his message. I mean, they were political activists as a group outside of their music. And I would hate to hear everything he had to say and everything that he stood for because it was completely contrary to what I believed. But I love the music. And it's foolishness to think that you could separate all of their beliefs, everything that he stood for from the music that he's putting out. Right. All that did was he said, oh, okay, you don't want to receive what I'm saying just when I stand up somewhere and, and I speak it. Well, you know what? I can put it to a song and I can make you love it and it's going to get into your mind and it's not going to go away. And they teach you things. And see, the thing is with the, with the music and the songs and the lyrics they're usually a little bit cryptic. They're usually a little bit darker. They're usually not quite as obvious what they're trying to get across to you, what they're actually teaching you, what, the, what it is, the message that they are getting through to your head. It's usually not quite as obvious because it's this lyrical language. You know, it's poetic. And, and you have to look a little bit deeper to see what is it that they're teaching me. But you don't think that much about the songs because you just like to hear it. You just like the way it sounds. You don't ever really meditate on too much, but subconsciously you do. Subconsciously that, that, that message has gotten into your head and now it's stuck with you. I think of a perfect example of this because I, 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 and I brought this up in sermons in the past. I'll probably continue to bring it up every time I preach on this because to me it was just mind-blowing when I actually realized what the song was saying. And, and many of you in this room, since most of the people in this room are, are, are a little bit closer to my age, might remember if you listen to world music, a song called Lola. Back in like the 70s, I think it was put out. And 
I remember, because I used to listen to classic rock station and all this other rock and roll and everything else, and I would listen to this, and this song would come on, and you'd know it. And it wasn't like one of my favorites or anything, but you'd know it, and you'd sing along. And then one day I realized this whole song is talking about a guy that's like dressed in drag. The guy that's dressed as a woman and like, you know, trying to, to pick up on this other guy. And this other guy's like, like having this conversation with this woman, you know, and, and at the end it's just like, he's, he's, it's a man. And it's disgusting and it's perverted. And this is what's being taught to you in this kind of bubbly, this kind of light-hearted sounded song. That's just getting in your head to just desensitize you to filth. To, to abomination, to garbage. And this is what's being pumped into your mind as you listen to the world's music. Right. And, it's, and it's, it's insane. But you accept it. Why? Because you like the way it feels. It is a lust of the flesh. And I, I understand this as much as anybody else, how that feeling is. It's like in your heart, in your soul. You hear that music come on, you hear that tune, like, oh man, this is, I love this song. I love this song. But that's how they get the message in that they want to get in. They appeal to your flesh. They appeal with the, with the chords, with the, with the strings, with the drums to make you feel and to put down your guard on what you're going to allow, what messages you're going to allow to come in to your mind. I believe, though, the most popular musicians that are out there are instruments of Satan directly. I don't think that it's just benign. I don't think that they're just doing their things. I think they're devils. I think a lot of these people have sold their souls to the devil, like quite literally or at least figuratively in a way where, where they care about the fame, they care about the fortune, they care about, you know, as, he was, as Satan was offering to Jesus Christ, they took that deal. Okay, I'll worship you. Give me all this stuff. I'll do it. I'll be your puppet. I'll be your pawn. And this is evidence. This is, look, this is, you call me crazy. I don't care. I know that we live in a realm that is not only physical, but they're spiritual. I know that there's a spiritual battle going on. I know that the Bible talks about devils and it talks about angels and it talks about battles going on in the present tense. I know that this stuff is happening. Okay? So you could call me crazy all you want, but I know also that Satan's going to try to be using people in this battle, just like Jesus was, was, was um, railing against the, the children of the devil. He called them the Pharisees, you child of the devil. There are children of the devil today. Hey, I'm a child of God, amen. I'm born again because I put my faith in Jesus Christ. Now I'm a child of God. But there are people out there that have made that deal with the devil that are children of the devil. They have made that decision and that's where they've gone. And they are on the enemy's side. And these people, whether they realize what they were getting into or not, it doesn't matter. They've gotten into things to where they don't even fully understand, I think, in many cases, what they've done. There's this thing called automatic writing. And many of the popular musicians, look, I know a lot about these musicians because, for one, I read biographies, I read autobiographies, I, read, I, not, I love the music so much that I would read about them. Like, not just listen to the music, but I mean, I, I, you know, I tried to get all their stuff, anything I could find about it. I was really into this stuff. And the things that I heard, and then even after that, I, I saw this other documentary that kind of put some of this stuff together. I think it's called They Sold Their Soul for Rock and Roll or something. And it, it, it's okay with the information it presents. They have kind of a false gospel, but, um, but some of the information they, they present is, is accurate and true. And there's this thing called automatic writing, and what, and what it is is that these musicians would describe how they were able to come up with music where they would literally just, they'd have the pen in their hand and it was just, the words were just coming out and they weren't even like thinking about it at all. It was just, it was just kind of appearing on the paper before them as they're just writing out. And they, were, they would talk about how amazing this was and it would be some of their best hits. Like they would just, they would have these words coming out and, and you know, I've heard it from their mouths. Where they would say, like, this happened to me. Like, I experienced this. In, in recordings, in interviews, they, they, don't, they don't deny it. They just say, yeah, this, you know, I, don't, I can't explain it. I don't know where it comes from. And, you know, a lot of them would be, you know, and, and, you know these, these rock stars would be heavy into drugs, heavy into drinking. And usually that's when they got their, their best songs is when they're all, you know, doped up and, and drugged out and stuff. And they would, they would get in this state where I believe that they would become demon-possessed. 
I believe that they were writing it not even of their own words, but of, of being possessed by the devil or one of his demons. This has happened. This is, this is a fact. You can look it up for yourself. For many, many, many of the famous artists have admitted to that. There was a Black Sabbath, right? There's Ozzy Osbourne and his wicked band. They claim that there was, you know, that, that they, they all would admit to this, that when they would play, it was like there was a fifth member, there was four members of the band, it was like the fifth member of their band that would just like bring them all together, that there was like an, an entity or, or something that they could feel present in their music. Music is powerful. A lot of people think, oh, it's just some gimmick. Oh, you just do this because they just want to make some extra money. They might want to make some extra money, but it's more, way more than just a gimmick. Bob Dylan is one who's been on record of basically saying that he sold his soul to the devil. Jim Morrison spake of communicating with spirits. He was always, you know, Mr. Mojo Rising was always talking about the, you know, this Indian spirit and stuff when he was a kid that, that went into his body. And you wonder where his music came from. You wonder why he died at 27 of a, of a drug overdose. Jimi Hendrix talked about, you know, his voodoo and his, and his voodoo music. You look at the Beatles or Led Zeppelin who, who uh, were buddy-buddy were with Aleister Crowley, the, the, the famous Satanist that, that was into witchcraft and all kinds of, of, of discussion. I think he was a sodomite as well, just into all kinds of wickedness. And they consulted him. And I think, you know, the Beatles even had a picture of him on their, on their Sgt. Pepper's uh, uh, album. And... I mean, you, when you start realizing more, you, you think, oh, the Beatles, I, I want to hold your hand. You know, it's just so harmless. It's just so, you know, no. Those guys were wicked. I mean, think about John Lennon was one of the Beatles who said, you know, imagine no heaven. Imagine no God. I mean, you know, his song, imagine, is wicked as hell. And these are the people that you want to listen to, right? The Rolling Stones or, the, you know, the open sodomites of, of the music industry, Fre Freddie Mercury, or the David Bowie. And you know what? David Bowie, not only did he have his own music, he wrote way more music than you would ever realize. He wrote songs for other people to play and for other people to perform and other people to sing. And that guy is an open, disgusting, perverted sodomite that hates God. And he's the one writing all these songs for other people. Say, oh, but they're not a sodomite. Yeah, but they're singing a sodomite song. Elton John's another one. Not only does Elton John perform, he also writes songs for other people that other people perform. They get their influence in it. Why? Because they have a message. They have a message from the devil and they want to get it into the Christian's head. They want to get it into the world's head. They want to get that, that perverted message into everybody's head. I could go on and on naming bands. I mean, I could, I could literally... And, and look, I know I've, I've mentioned all these old bands, you know, these bands from the 60s and the 70s and stuff. That's more of what I was into. But there, I could go... And I don't want to go on and on and on all morning just naming every single band. Because I just, I just don't want to do it. I mean, it's, just not, it's not worth it. You get where we're going, and you can apply this. I don't care if I didn't mention your favorite band that's of the world. You know what? It's going to apply to them, too. And the modern stuff, I don't even know who's popular these days. But I don't have to know who they are. Right. I know the way the trend has been going. And it's not been getting better. The trend has been getting way more filthy, way more blasphemous. I think, man... There's stuff they play these days that was never even allowed on the radio when I was a kid. I mean, there's, and, and I'm not that old. <laughs> I'm still in my 30s. So to, to see the decline and the moral decay in, in the music is just, is just you know, a picture of, of what's happening within our country. Right. And how, how bad it's gotten. How it, it, I see these videos or these little clips I think it was just like maybe a couple years ago of, uh, of, of the, the Super Bowl halftime, right? I mean, everyone's watching the Super Bowl, and they had a Super Bowl halftime, and it literally had a picture of, of the whore riding the great beast at halftime. And no one, oh, it's just art. Yeah, there's this big, like, golden calf or whatever, and, and literally one of the, the Hollywood whores or these, these music industry whores sitting on it, dressed in almost nothing, and just, you know, they got the fire flaming out and stuff as, as they're making their entrance uh, and, you know, for the halftime show. It's completely satanic. And it's like, what in the world is wrong with our society that that's even acceptable, that that's something you're going to play on television? 
that you're going to clap and cheer over when they come out on stage. And what? We're backwards. It, and it's, and it's, it's gotten this way over years and years and years of progression. Years of, of acceptance of the filth. And the theme of, of almost all music genres is the same. Idolatry. Greed, right? Love of money. You can think of the hip hop. You think of the rap. You think of even all of these stuff. All the rock. They always glorified their money and their cars. The fornication and adultery with all the women, right? The rock and roll lifestyle. The drunkenness. The sex, drugs, and rock and roll, right? I mean, isn't that what the music is promoting? That's literally what the music is about. That's what it's promoting. And that's what you want to listen to? The rebellion? Rebellion's a big one. The rebellion of rock and roll. The Bible says in 1 Samuel 15, 23, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. And that was Samuel talking to, to Saul. Turn if you would to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. When you see what they're, when you know what they're about, when you know that they're promoting all this wickedness, it's also no surprise that all these rock stars, these rebellious rock stars, the men all had long hair. Every single one of them. I remember when, when I was in junior high, because I was into all that stuff and I was watching all these guys, they all had the long hair. You know what? I tried to grow my hair a lot long too. And I did. And I had, you know, I hate to say it, but I had a mullet, right? It was back in like the, in the, in the 80s. So I had the short hair on the side, short on top, and then whoosh, going back long in the back, right? But we're going to see in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 what God thinks about this. What the Bible has to say about a man having long hair. Look at verse number 3 of 1 Corinthians 11. The Bible says, But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Christ is our head as men. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. So when you have your head covered as a man, your physical head, you dishonor your true head, which is Christ. It's a dishonor unto Christ. It says verse 5, But every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered dishonoreth her head. For that is even all one as if she were shaven. For if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, for as much as he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. For as the woman is of the man, even so is the man also by the woman, but all things of God. Verse number 13, look what it says. Judging yourselves, is it comely that a woman pray unto God uncovered? Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? The Bible is saying, look, doesn't even nature tell you that it's a shame for a man to be walking around with long hair? He said, let alone Scripture or the Bible. He's saying, isn't it just something that naturally you, you have an instinct of just when a man has long hair, it's a shame, and when a woman has long hair, it's a glory unto her? But, you know, a lot of people will, will look at this and come up with these false doctrines of these women wearing the head coverings and all this other stuff when they go to church or when they pray in private. Saying, they're saying, well, look, your head needs to be covered. And they just, I think they just never read verse 15. In all of this, this, this reading of, of covering and uncovering and a man's head being covered and everything, I don't think they read verses 14 or 15. Verse 15 says, but if a woman have long hair, it is a glory for, to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. It defines it right there. The covering that we've just been reading about, being covered, being uncovered, it's talking about your hair. Your head being covered, being covered with hair. It never mentions any other material. Of course it's talking about hair. But anybody who's being honest with themselves, being honest with the Bible, can see that this is what the Bible's teaching. And it lines up perfectly with why the, the rock stars all have this long hair as men. Why? 
because they're dishonoring Christ and they're being rebellious. Right. And especially at that time, you know, again, coming out of the 40s and out of the 50s, it was a much more wholesome life in, in, in America. It was much more, you know, there was a lot more people who had biblical beliefs. There's a lot more people who, who cared about, you know, having this type of mindset and cared about the things of God. But what happened? There was a big rebellion against that. And the people had nothing to do with that. And what they do? They rebelled. They grew out their hair. And they, and, they, and they sang about all this life of this hedonistic life. If it feels good, do it. I'm just going to do this drug because that's what I want to do. I'm going to fornicate because I think it feels good and I want to do that. And I'm going to call it love. God calls it fornication. Not to mention all the nakedness, especially these days. The female stars are nothing more than just a bunch of whore out, whores out there on the stage. They're, they're doing all these perverted acts. And, you know, you thought, they thought Elvis was bad when he came out with, with his hip shaking. And look, I'm not for Elvis either, okay? But you thought that was bad? Look at where we've come. I mean, they're, they're practically having intercourse on stage these days. We went from a hip shake to, to, to wearing almost nothing and having intercourse on stage. That's where we're at today. And this is where today's music is going to get you. Think about that with your kids, too, and what you let your kids listen to. Because they're going to idolize these people. Because they, the, these, these rock bands are all about the self-glorifying image, too. As children of Satan, you know what they do? They're, they take the attributes of Satan. Satan is lifted up with pride. He wants everyone glorifying and worshiping him. Guess what they do? They're lifted up and all full of themselves. And they hold their own worship services. They're called rock concerts. You ever been to one? I've been to plenty. They turn the lights down. Everyone's got their arms up. Yeah! And just worshiping the people on the stage. And they're strutting their stuff and you know, trying to look all cool and doing their thing. Why? Because they're full of pride. They're full of themselves. And the people end up idolizing them. I did. I had the posters up on my wall. The stickers, the, the, all the merchandise, everything else, just lifting them up. I paid all the money to go to these events. You can't fool me now. I was deceived then. You can't fool me now. I know what it's all about. Music is spiritual. I was in 1 John 4, 1, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. We need to be able to try the spirits. And, and music is spiritual. Turn, if you would, to 1 Samuel 16. I'm going to prove it to you from the Bible that how spiritual music is. This affects your spirit life. Don't think that, that oh, music, it's not that big of a deal. It is a big deal. It could have a profound impact on your life without you even realizing it. And I can tell you from experience, when, when I would allow myself, after having the knowledge and after knowing what's right, after being saved, and, and after realizing how wicked this music was, and, and I would, you know, I purged myself from it. Early on, when I first was getting right with God in general, when I, when I first went to a good, independent, fundamental Baptist ch church that just taught me all kinds of stuff, real early on, I took a sledgehammer, I took a hammer and, and, and a spike, and I destroyed all of my music collection. Every single one. Because the thought process in my head was, and, and I had a lot of money just piled into what I owned. I and mean, it was valuable. I had rare stuff. I had all your know, complete sets, all this stuff. I had stuff where they, you know, when they when they banned things, but I, you know, the, the extra tracks that were on there, like uh, whatever. It doesn't even matter what it is. But um, all this stuff that was worth a ton of money. But when I realized how wicked it was, I couldn't justify selling it and just saying, "Well, here, here's a bunch of filth and wickedness. Why don't you give me some money and I'll just give this to you." If something's wrong like that, don't make a profit on it. And I don't care what your financial situation is either. Because it's not going to profit you just to give wickedness and filth unto someone else. Right. So I, I came to this truth and I said, you know what? I'm not even going to throw it away. Because if I throw it away, someone can just pull it out of the garbage. Someone can just find it somewhere. I said, I don't want anybody to listen to this stuff. I know it's out there in other places, but nobody's going to get my garbage. 
And I just, I took a hammer, I just destroyed all, every single CD, every tape, everything I had was completely destroyed. And that's what ought to be done to it. It's garbage, it's filth, it needs to just be burned and, and, and ground up in the brook Kydron. You're in 1 Samuel 16, though. This is, music is spiritual. We're going to see that here. See, Saul had a problem. Saul had a spiritual problem. When Saul was not right with God, God sent an evil spirit to plague him, to trouble him. Now, why did he do that? Because he wanted him to get right with God. God could do that sometimes. He could cause you to be troubled. You know, did you ever notice that, too? When you, when you get into sin and you start willfully sinning and you start getting away from God, you're, you're going to have something inside just kind of gnawing at you. And you know it's not right. And you've and you got a choice to make. You could either continue to just, just be stiff-necked and, and turn away from God, or you just go back to God. And I'll tell you what, you don't want to be stiff-necked. Saul, King Saul was stiff-necked. Saul lost his life as a result of his sin and his hard heart. But look at what happened here in, in, in 1 Samuel 16, verse number 14. The Bible says, But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul... And an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. And Saul's servants said unto him, Behold, now an evil spirit from God troubleth thee. Let our Lord now command thy servants, which are before thee, to seek out a man who is a cunning player on an harp. And it shall come to pass, when the evil spirit from God is upon thee, that he shall play with his hand, and thou shalt be well. And then jump down to verse 23. And it came to pass... When the evil spirit from God was upon Saul, that David took an harp and played with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well, and the evil spirit departed from him. This was Saul's solution to his problem with God. You know what? When you get in a bad mood, when you have this evil spirit troubling you, put on some music that you like. Play the music. Just get someone who's skilled in music. That'll make you feel all better. That'll make you feel good. And you know what? It worked. It worked. When, when, when God was playing with the evil spirit and David played on the harp, guess what happened? The evil spirit departed from him. He felt better. Now, he was just masking his problem, but that shows you the power that the music had in his life. When he had this evil spirit, you know what? The music helped. The music helped solve that. But you know what? The music didn't help further down the road. It helped at first. It helped for a little while, but his little band-aid fix by not getting right with God and just trying to ignore it and just, and just put his mind on something else and just start to feel good because of this music, it wasn't enough for him. Because after a while, you're going to start reading when, when David would play with his hand and Saul picked up a javelin and tries to kill him with it against the wall. <laughs> it just wasn't helping at all. He was still plagued with the evil spirit. So it's, not, you know, it, it's a temporary fix that's only going to make things worse when you try to get away from it. But I, the reason why we, we turned there was just to, to illustrate and to show you the power that music has and, and that it is spiritual. That music itself gets to your soul. I mean, we sing out of the songbooks, you know, soul-stirring songs and hymns. And they are soul-stirring songs and hymns. I love them. And, and the music affects me, you know, either way, but we need to make sure we're affected by the good music, by the right music, and not by the world's music and what Satan is putting out there. I'm just going to, you don't have to turn there, but in 1 John 2, I'm going to reread it for you. Where the Bible said, Love not the, the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Now, I spent most of the morning preaching against the world's music, as in the rock and roll, you know, the rap, R&B, whatever, all, all the stuff that the world puts out there. But that's not all that you need to watch out for. Now, if we're not supposed to love the things of the world, if God has called us to be a peculiar people, if we're supposed to be separate, if we're supposed to be sanctified, if he says, you're a peculiar people, you know, there's going to be, you're different from the world. You ought to look different. You ought to speak different. You ought to act different. Don't you think our music ought to sound different? But what we have these days is this Christian contemporary music that patterns itself off of the world. And you start reading these, these Christian artists, these Christian bands, and you say, well, who are your influences? Jimi Hendrix, 
Led Zeppelin, they start naming all of the world's music. And they say, you know what? Yeah, we pattern our music after the world. You think that's glorifying to God when God says to love not the things of the world? You, you think it's acceptable to take all the sounds, all the music of this world and just insert Jesus? To say, well, we'll just, we'll just add Jesus here and then it's all good. No. We're supposed to be different. We're supposed to be set apart. We're supposed to love not the things of the world. That includes the world's music. Don't bring the world's music into the church. Don't bring the world's music into God's house. God's got his own music. And it's different. And that's one thing you know. Do you, does anyone ever hear songs like Rock of Ages or the way that these hymns sound in church today just on the radio on any of the world's music stations? Because I don't. I don't hear anything that sounds anything like them. Because, why? Because they're different. They're different from the world's music. And the songs that we sing have doctrine to them. We teach each other in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Now, they should be uplifting, they're admonishing, they're edifying, they're great. I love music. God gave us an entire song book in the book of Psalms, the biggest book of the Bible. God loves music. He created musical beings. He, you read about in heaven how he has, he has a host just, just singing and praising unto his name. God loves music too. God loves when we praise him. You read through the book of Psalms, praise the Lord. Praise God. You see that, that command over and over again. Praise God. Praise is praising and singing unto the Lord. But let's make sure we have the right music and we don't let the, the, the devil's worldly music influence and impact us. And look, I know, you know what? You might say, yeah, but I love my music. Is it, is it a... Do you decide what you're going to do? and what you're going to allow in your life just based on if you feel good because of it? I mean, if that's the case, then why not go out and commit adultery and fornicate? I mean, it feels good, right? If that's the case, why not just get involved in a bunch of drugs and, and dope yourself up? It feels good, right? Don't apply it to those things and not to the music, too. Just say, well, the music just feels so good. I love to listen to it. Take a look at it. If you can see, if you could see where I preach this morning... And, and say, you know what, you know what, Pastor, you're right. But I still have all of this stuff. Don't keep it. Because here's the thing, a lot of times what people want to do is say, well, yeah, I shouldn't listen to this and you just kind of put it away in the closet. I'm not going to listen to this anymore. But then you know what's going to happen later on? You're thinking, well, maybe I want it later. It's like, it's like you're putting stuff away for like a later sin, for like a future sin. Don't do that. Just, just deal with it now. Just, just cut it out of your life. Rip it out, get rid of it, and be done with it. And look, it may be a little painful. It's painful for me at first. I mean, th that was a big investment. It's a big part of my life. It's something I really love. But you know what? Thank God that it's not in my life anymore. All it was doing was bringing me down. It was that, that little Band-Aid feeling you know, even for years after I was saved, but I was still living in the, in the party lifestyle, the drinking lifestyle, and the music, you know, the music made me feel good. Even though I was super depressed and, 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 and angry and, and nothing was working out great because I was not listening to God and I had a, a, you know, a troubling spirit from God on me because I wasn't doing what was right when I knew I should be doing what was right. The music helped, helped to, to feel a little better, but you know, it didn't solve any of my problems at all. And it would have been way better just to get rid of it way back then. To get back on the right path as just one of the things that was wrong in my life. But the world's music is not going to help you spiritually at all. It's only going to hurt you. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for giving us this wisdom from your word, dear God. I pray that you please help us all to take heed to ourselves and, and <clears throat> to the music that we listen to, dear Lord. I pray that you would please help us all. Anyone who has a problem with this, dear Lord, like I did for so long, I understand it. And I pray that you please help us have the strength to acknowledge and just make the decision in our life to just say, you know what, God? I love you more than I love my flesh. I love you more than I love this world. And I'm just going to give up this stuff because it's not helping me at all. Dear Lord, I pray that you please help us all to have that type of a mindset and attitude with whatever it is. Even if it's not this particular sin, dear Lord, help us to just love you enough to be able to remove the, uh, the, the sin in our life. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.